The nervous system is divided into two major branches, the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord and acts as the decision maker for uh, the body, for muscles. Uh, it's the source of cognition. It receives information from the peripheral, makes a decision of how to respond, and then the peripheral outputs any behavioral uh, choices that have been made by the central nervous system. Uh, we will be breaking down the components of the central nervous system uh, here in a little bit. Uh, but we're going to start by breaking down the peripheral nervous system. Uh, it is divided into the autonomic and the somatic. And then the autonomic is often divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So we will be exploring what each of these are, but I just want you to take a look at the overall organization of the system to begin with. So first of all, right, to emphasize the difference between the CNS and the PNS, the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord and is the decision maker. The peripheral nervous system is all the other neurons that extend throughout the body from the tips of your toes up through your face. All right, these are motor neurons that control the muscles of your body, sensory neurons that receive information from the environment. These are neurons that regulate your organs, your liver, your heart, your lungs, right, your gallbladder. Right? Uh, these are neurons that are involved in sexual response. Right? Uh, these are all the neurons distributed throughout the whole entire body that are receiving information, coordinating action between different organs and tissues, right? and then executing motor responses uh, as determined by the central nervous system. Right? So the CNS, again, is executive control. The PNS is sort of receiving information and then regulating everything based on the decisions of the central nervous system. So let's zoom in on the peripheral nervous system. As I said, there's two main divisions, the autonomic and the somatic. The autonomic are things that we can't control consciously very effectively. Right? And these are things that, um, such as our heart rate, uh, whether or not uh, we're producing stomach acid, whether or not our pancreas should release insulin, right? whether or not our bladder should contract or relax, our heart rate, Right, uh, even our breathing rates, right, are often regulated by the autonomic system. We don't have to think about them. We don't have to be aware about them. They are automatic in nature. This is opposed to somatic, which are things that are under voluntary movement, uh, voluntary control, right? This is mostly skeletal muscle systems. These are things that you can start and stop at will. Talking, walking, moving your hands, chewing. Right? These are all things that you can decide to do or not to do at any moment, right? So it's not just being able to, to do them, it's also being able to stop them, right? If you have that kind of voluntary control to start and stop at will, it's regulated by the somatic system. Some things share elements of both. Breathing is a common one. I just talked about how the autonomic system autonomic nervous system often regulates our breathing, but we can start and stop our breathing uh, at will. Right. And why breathing falls into that category is up to an interesting debate. And it might be helpful in regulating and, uh, because when we breathe things in, we're breathing the environment in. So if you walk into an environment, a room, a building, or even outside, you smell something terrible, like a chemical or a gas, or there's something in that environment, you're like, oh, that's gross. It's better to be able to stop your breathing and stop bringing that into your body as much as possible. Some other people have also proposed it's an aquatic adaptation. Right? As primates go, we are one of the best swimmers out there. Uh, not many primates are as adapted to the water as we are, and being able to hold your breath for prolonged periods of time is an important element of aquatic adaptation. Uh, but whatever the reason, right, breathing kind of can span both somatic and autonomic. All right. So there are autonomic elements and somatic elements, but most things are going to fall pretty cleanly into autonomic or somatic. The autonomic has two primary roles, to upregulate or downregulate the body. Upregulating it, increasing its activity, its actions, its arousing nature, uh, energizing is called the sympathetic nervous system. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system downregulates the body, slows things down. It is the calming element. You may have heard of the sympathetic nervous system. Again, sympathetic and parasympathetic are both under autonomic control. And you may have uh, heard of the sympathetic system described as fight or flight, right? The fight or flight mode 
uh, is uh, one where we are energized, we are excited, and our whole body responds to it. Our pupils dilate, they get wide open, which helps us bring more light in. We can see way more things, we can see edges, we can see a broader field of view, but it comes at the expense of focus. And right? if you've ever had your eyes dilated, like at a um, uh, an optometrist, uh, that dilates the eyes really wide, uh, and you get a lot of light in there, but you can't focus. Everything is blurry, right? So why would we want to do that? Well, it turns out in a fight or flight response, it's probably be better to see more at less detail, right? You don't have to see the gold trim on the samurai sword. You just need to know where the samurai sword is coming from, right? So our pupils dilate, our heartbeat starts to accelerate. It goes faster, pumping blood and energy to all of our muscles. Our digestion system inhibits greatly because it turns out it takes a lot of energy to digest our food, right? And the, in, uh, the body inhibits that digestion to reserve energy for whatever stress response we need to have. Our liver releases its glucose scores, uh, its glucose stores, which is the fuel for the body, allowing our muscles and all of our organs to function at an optimal level for longer, right? We excrete certain hormones or other neurotransmitters like epinephrine or norepinephrine or adrenaline, right? That helps upregulate all of our organs. Our gallbladder actually relaxes, right? It takes energy to contract our gallbladder and hold that urine in. And if you're in a fight or flight response, right? If that bear is chasing you down, then it's probably worth it to relax the, uh, the bladder and get that extra energy in your legs to help you escape. It doesn't matter if you urinate. Right. And this is why you can wind up in situations where people can be so scared, so startled, they actually might urinate themselves. Right. Uh, something that can happen. And it's part of the sympathetic nervous system. Right. It's this upregulation, this fight or flight. Now, keep in mind, it is not literally fight or flight. Right. This is anything that causes a high degree of stress. Okay. So there are uh, elements. Uh, in our lives that are highly stressful that don't elicit a literal fight or flight, right? If you uh, uh, mess up at work and your boss comes in and you know you're in trouble, you're going to have a talk about it, you get nervous, you get energized, you get jittery, right? The sympathetic nervous system is activated, but it doesn't mean that you're preparing to either run out of the office screaming or turn around, haul off and punch your boss in the face, right? It's not literally fight or flight. It's just this upregulation. You have all this energy, you have all this endurance, you have all this speed and focus, and wow, this just sounds great. Why don't we do this all the time? Because it's exhausting. Absolutely exhausting. You would tear your body apart. You would destroy your organs. We have to be able to downregulate the system. And that's where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in. This is the rest and digest. This is the calming act. This is the calming action, right? We see the reverse response throughout the body. The pupils dilate. I mean, the pupils contract. The heartbeat slows. Digestion is stimulated, right? All of our energy is focused on relaxing and digesting, right? And again, digestion takes a lot of energy and is a big part of the parasympathetic nervous system. That's why a turkey gets kind of a bad rep. It's making everybody tired because most people associate eating a lot of turkey with Thanksgiving, right? And then you eat a big Thanksgiving meal and you're like, oh man, I need a nap. And so you blame the tryptophan and the turkey. It's probably not the turkey's fault, right? The average American at a Thanksgiving feast will consume well over 4,000 calories, that is a lot of calories and your body gets dumped with all these cal cal calories and it's just like, oh God, what do I got to do with this? And all you want to do is lay on the couch and take a nap because it takes so much energy. This is also why exercise is very difficult to do after consuming food, right? If your system has to digest it and you try to go for a run, your, your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems are going to be in opposition with each other. All right. So sympathetic is arousing, parasympathetic is calming. Those of you who find keeping track of sympathetic and parasympathetic difficult uh, might find uh, this uh, little uh, mnemonic device useful. Uh, if you ever fall out of an airplane that is cruising at 20,000 feet, what is the one thing you really want to have? My guess would be a parachute. Why? Because a parachute slows you down. Parachute slows you down parasympathetic nervous system slows you down. All right. So, uh, that is the major components of the autonomic system. Uh, when we start talking about 
the peripheral nervous system, then we also talk about the somatic nervous system. So to understand that, we have to understand how the peripheral nervous system is receiving and sending information. There's what we call the afferent system and the efferent system. The afferent system, maybe think afferent A for arrive, is incoming information coming from the sensory system. The efferent system is outgoing information, exit, efferent exit, that is traveling to your muscles and activating muscle responses. The afferent system comes into the spinal cord, the efferent system comes out of the spinal cord, and this is how our body pulls information in and pushes information out. Uh, the spinal cord can actually make decisions, right? If you remember, I said the central nervous system is the executive decision maker, right? And this includes the spinal cord. The spinal cord can actually activate motor responses through something called the interneuron, all right? So the interneuron traverses across the sensory neuron and attaches to the motor neuron. Right? When this incoming sensory information exceeds a threshold, it causes neurotransmitters to be released. The interneuron receives that information, and then if it's activated, that means the incoming sensory information is strong enough, the interneuron fires and immediately activates a motor neuron, which causes a behavioral response. This is most common in reflexes. Right? If you touch something hot, if you grab a hot pan, your hand likely has pulled away from that hot pan before you've even realized what you've done because of the speed that the uh, spinal cord can execute that decision. Okay. And when we look at the spinal cord, here's a slice of the spinal cord, we see a division of white matter and gray matter. White matter is the myelinated axons. Myelination is a fatty tissue that surrounds the axons, right? And therefore tends to appear white, whereas the gray matter are the cell bodies and the dendrites. All right, so we'll see that in the brain and throughout the nervous system, white matter is myelon and axons, interconnections, gray matter are dendrites and cell bodies. All right. So the white matter tends to be along the outer edge, much more sort of lateral in the spinal cord, whereas the medial part of the spinal cord is that gray matter. The sensory and motor neurons are actually split between the ventral and dorsal roots. Right? So the sensory neuron are dorsal in our back. So the uh, sensory information comes into the back of the spinal cord, whereas the motor neurons, the afferent neurons, come out from the ventral system. This is known as the bell Magendi law, which was established uh, by uh, Bell, who was a English researcher uh, who discovered the dorsal roots and Magendi who discovered the ventral roots. All right, so the bell Magendi law says that incoming sensory information is dorsal in the spinal cord, whereas the ventral controls the motor neurons. And that is the peripheral nervous system and its integration in the spinal cord. So now we're going to pull back and we are going to talk more about the central nervous system, in particular, the brain.